The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Here we are in Hebrews 10, 14. <clears throat> and our, our, doctrine, our doctrine that we're going to study tonight is positional truth. And I'll tell you, I think positional truth is one of the all-time great doctrines. It, 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 for me, it resolves so many issues that people have. If they, uh, that there's a lot of confusion over, like eternal security and uh, what happens if you get saved, then you go back into sin and then you die all that, all, all, I mean, just tons of bad stuff uh, could be corrected uh, theologically in this one doctrine. Uh, it, it was such a revolutionary doctrine for me when I learned it for my own Christian life. And then as a pastor, it is one of the key doctrines I use all the time in helping. It, it for me, you know, problem-solving device. I think it is one of the great problem-solving devices uh, for people. I, I use it a lot. And so I want to I want to talk a little bit. We've talked about sanctification and a lot of these issues recently uh, in the Hebrew study. Uh, but uh, today we're going to talk about position truth, and it's in verse 14. And, and I'll show you in a moment why positional truth is such a dynamite. It's a basic doctrine, too. You, it's a salvation doctrine. And I think that's why it's so good in talking with people because you can talk to baby believers, immature believers, mature believers, but this doctrine is it's basic. But here's what he says in verse 14. Um, well, let me get to chapter 10. Um, for by one offering... And he's been talking about that one offering be Jesus Christ on the cross. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And here's what he did. Now, the offering is what we call Christ died on the cross, was buried and raised from the dead third day. That's the gospel. The offering is the gospel uh, to us. It's Christ must die. He must be buried. He must be raised. That's called the gospel in 1 Corinthians as you well know, 3 and 4. The moment you believe it in Romans 1.16, then this gospel is the power of God to save you to those who believe. When you do that, then you're able to enter into a great theology of Ephesians, the second chapter, verse 8 and 9, for by grace we're saved through faith and not of ourselves, this gift of God, not of works. Now, this, this is an enormous, this is called the gospel. And when you believe it, you get saved. Now, here's, here's where, and here's what he does. Here's what Paul does. Here's the word offering. You with me? Watch this again in verse 14. For by how many offerings? One. And, he, and he's talking about Christ on the cross, being buried and raised from the dead. He's talking about what Christ did that we have faith in that can save us. Okay. And Paul tells us how that works. Now he says, and look what he does. He, off, he connects the offering, which is salvation. This is salvation. This is salvation. That's the salvation package, we call it. That's the eternal redemption. And he connects it with positional truth. It's the word sanctified. Notice the word sanctified. This is called positional sanctification. And he connects the two. Watch this again in your, in your I, I'm just trying to show you the mechanics of it. For by one offering, he has perfected or completed for, for how long? Listen, these two things, the offering, the salvation, and sanctification are for all time. For all time. Understand that? 
not for some time, not for a little while. The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit into union with Jesus Christ, with him or with Christ. You are baptized by the Holy Spirit in union with him. We call that positional sanctification. And that is when you believe that automatically, that's, this is part of the eight works of the Holy Spirit at salvation. You are baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. Where is he? Right hand of God the Father in heaven. Therefore, he says, he is seated, right? And when you believe, you are seated, right? We just studied that. You are seated. When you're saved, you're baptized by the Holy Spirit into union with Christ. That's called positional sanctification, and it's for all time. Not for some time, not for a little time, for all time. Or what the writer really said was forever. That's pretty powerful, people. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. How were they sanctified? By accepting the offering on their behalf. Agreed? Yes. yes. And so that's, and that's called positional sanctification. And it's in Christ. Right? And when you believe the gospel, you're in Christ. You've become a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And this is what we call the package. This is the 50 things that you receive. And we say this. These are 50 things you receive. This is the part of the package. This is only one, but that's part of the package of grace salvation. And we say that you can never lose in what? In time nor eternity. Where do we get that? From this phrase, for all time. You'll see tonight that that actually means forever. And so this is a powerful doctrine. This is a powerful doctrine. When do, when do I get sanctification? Tell me, tell me a basic, just a basic meaning for sanctification. Being set apart for what? This is, it's not just being set apart. Because this word, H-A-G-I-A-S-M-O-S. -S, Hagamos is the word sanctification. And that word right in there is holy. The Holy Spirit, the Holy God, the Holy Child, the Holy, you understand? Hagios. Hagios is the word that comes out of that. Hagios. That's the, also, Hagios is the word for saint. We become a saint. But we're set apart unto the holiness of God. In fact, we're set apart in the holiness of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're all holy. The Holy Father, the Holy Son, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Bible. You are holy positionally now experientially you've got to grow you, you've got to pay attention to your pattern of growth and pattern of life and things of that nature you got to walk by the spirit you got to walk by faith but at the point this means at the point of salvation God the Holy Spirit sets you aside unto holiness and positionally you have it whether you experience whether you live it out experientially or not you have it at birth, 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 salvation birth, being born again. You have it at that point, And the next time you have it, in, and that's an absolute 100%. You understand? That's a 100% holiness positionally. The next time you can have it, no matter how your life is in phase two, right? The Christian life. You know the next time you get it? That's absolutely phase three. When you die and go to be with the Lord. You know why? Because they're both based on positional sanctification. You don't go to heaven because you got saved and then lived a certain way. You know why? Because positional truth takes it out. You do understand. Per, you do understand. That's a locked deal. When you believe here, that's automatically happens. You, that's not a choice you make. 
This is a choice you made. I didn't know I got that when I got saved. I just want to get saved and not go to hell. I said, that was me. Man, I, didn't know, I didn't know 50 things I received at salvation. And I based my whole faith not up a sense of truth. I based it on John 10, 28 through 30, which is positional truth, by the way. <laughs> but nobody told me that. But that's okay. I'm telling you. Because it's an enormous doctrine. What I'm telling you is an enormous doctrine. If you get this under your belt, you will understand that once you're saved, you're always saved, and you can never lose it. Don't let anybody lie to you about it because the Word of God is filled with the truth. This doctrine is every time you see the words in Him, that's positional truth. Every time you see in Christ, in Him, is positional truth. Every time. And boy, you want to study? Look that up. Look that up and study what it means to be in Christ. And you're talking about positional truth. It's an enormous doctrine. Well, let's talk, stop and have a word of prayer. I'm going to feel my engine running. i got to get my car in gear. So, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't study it, nor can you apply it to your life in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. It's your responsibility as a believer priest, according to 1 Peter 2, 5, and 9, to confess your sin. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, here is the promise, the guarantee to you that God is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. That allows the Holy Spirit. You now are able to return to fellowship through with God through the Holy Spirit, and he is able now to teach you the truth of the Word of God. I give you a moment to exercise your priesthood privileges. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way by automobile and the Internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this study through positional sanctification. What enormous doctrine, Father, of grace. Whoa. May we communicate a little bit of that. Wet the appetite, Father, for more knowledge of this great doctrine in Jesus' name. Amen. Notice at the top of your paper, I wrote out Hebrews 10, 14 and, and brought a few ideas in the Greek language to you. For example, the concept of one offering. Under the old covenant, they, they had many offerings many times, right? Until Christ would come and then it would be one offering for all time. So that's a great theological principle um, and who would want to be under see you can't you cannot unite the old covenant new covenant under one banner because he, book of Hebrews says that Christ came to do to complete the old covenant uh, and we live in a fulfillment day of that you can't go back to that period because under for example the offering Many priests over many time, over years, priest after priest after priest, did many sacrifices year in, year out, the same old business. And it was until Christ would come. And then that would be abolished. It's really important because there is a concept that somehow the church can, can merge Old Covenant, New Covenant together. And I'll tell you what you get. You get apostasy. You don't get good law and you don't get good grace. So you don't get good theology. That's uh, a terrible thing. And boy, the devil has used that as a wedge in the church for years. Well, anyhow, by one offering, he has perfected. Remember this word perfected. If it's teleo, and it is here, then it means complete or finished. Jesus said this word in the perfect tense on the cross, you remember. It is finished. It is complete. What was he talking about? Redemption. And then he calls it, the writer of Hebrew calls redemption. Once Jesus pays the penalty and completes it, he calls it eternal redemption in Hebrews 9.12. That's an enormous idea. And then this little word, watch this on your paper now, for all time. This is a ice, it's a prepositional phrase, by the way, for all time. It's a prepositional phrase, ice plus accused of time. And that has the definite article to, T-O, and then it has this Greek word uh, for, and it's a compound word. It comes from dia, 
and then this word E-N-E-K-E, -E, uh, and it, that, that word means, now the definite article is kind of important because it puts a spotlight on it. The word means to carry something through, to, be, to carry something through. Like, you know, you're told to do something, and carrying it through means it's finished. Okay? And therefore, it's, it's uh, not to be continued. It, it, it has reached a place. That's why it's used with the word perfect. When it's completed, then that completed work is for all times or forever. And that's what it means. And who is it for? Now, here's what's it. This is where you come in. It's got your name. This has got your name on it. See, you're one of those who? You're one of the those who? If you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, this is a gift, not of works. This is a gift. Those who are sanctified, notice it has the definite article T-O-U-S, and then the word with uh, that deals with sanctification. This is a verbal form of it. This is the, the actual event of it. The present passive participle. You know why it's important? Listen, see that present tense? That's continuous action. Right? And what's it connected to? For all times. <laughs> For all time. And how long is that? It's forever. It's forever. How do I know it? Because of the perfect tense with this phrase. That's how I know it. What's the verb tense mean? Completed in the past, the results, it remains completed forever. Come on now. That's a, that's a powerful little idea. This Greek verse, Hebrews 10, 14, this Greek verse establishes three phases of new covenant sanctification. Positional, that's phase one salvation, that has this verb teleo in the perfect tense as an indicative. Progressive, I put these in P words. It's just easier for me. I've learned them the other way, but I like these. Uh, progressive, that's phase two, the Christian way of life. That's why it's in the present tense. It's not in the heiress tense. Come on now. It's not in the heiress tense. It's in the present tense. Because, listen, here's where it started. You go from positional to the Christian way of life. I call it progressive, uh, Bob called it experiential, and that's a key. That, that's the life you and I live. We live a life set apart into the holiness of God. A as a re result, we're supposed to be blameless, undefiled, right? How we do that, you can't do it in the flesh. That's willpower. Now, a believer could do it. He ain't going to heaven. How do you do that? In the power of the Holy Spirit. You walk by faith in the power of the Lord. You can't do this in the flesh. You can't do it by sight. That's why he says you don't walk in the flesh. You walk in the spirit. You don't walk by sight. You walk by faith, right? You can't do this stuff. You can't be holy in the flesh. If you could, then everybody would go to heaven one day. If he did by somebody's schedule, I don't know. You know, you'd have to, you know, every election that would change. Looks like. Well, anyhow, and then the permanent, uh, permanent, which we used to call ultimate, and that's okay with me, but I call it permanent because I like three Ps. Positional, progressive, and permanent. Listen, if you have, listen to me, that's important. If you have positional sanctification, you automatically have the other. You understand? You automatically have it. If you die, you go to heaven. Because, listen, it's not based on how you live. It's based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. You don't go to heaven because you live a certain way of life. Carry about around a family Bible, weighs 40 pounds, and you think I've carried it all my life. I'm bound to be able to go to heaven. Who else has carried 40 pounds of a Bible? It's got all the family record in it. It's not how you go to heaven. If you think you're going to go to heaven, you're going the other way. I mean, somebody's got to tell you the absolute truth. Let the word of God speak to your heart. That's what it had. That's how I got saved. If you got one, you got three. But if you have one, it don't mean you got two, even though you got one and three. You understand? Two is decisions and volition you have to make in your daily living. You got to walk by the Spirit. That's a command in the present tense. 
And he, he writes this. He said, you know, listen, because listen, you're saved by grace. He hung his, he's hung at his, he hung his son on the cross so that you could be with him forever. That's eternal life. When do you get that? You can't, you, he doesn't give you eternal life and take it away. You know why? Because of 1 John 5, 11 through 13. 1 John 5, 11 through 13 says, if you have the son, you, listen, he says, in, in, the, in Jesus Christ is eternal life. If you have Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. If you don't have Jesus Christ, you don't have eternal life. <laughs> Jeez. 1 John 5, 11 through 13 is just a dynamite passage. If you have phase one, you automatically have phase three, but you don't automatically have phase two. That's the Christian way of life. Hebrews 2.11. For both he, the Holy Spirit in context, who sanctifies those and those who are sanctified are all from one father, for which reason he, Jesus Christ, is not ashamed to call them brothers. All three members, listen to me now, all three members of the Godhead are involved in, posi in, in positional sanctification. They're invo involved in all of sanctification, but all three of them are involved in positional sanctification. Listen, that's why John 10, 28 through 30 is so important. important. Listen, he says, the moment you believe the gospel, you're in the hands of Christ. And Christ is in the hands of God. And no man can take them out of the hand. And then people come along and say, well, no man, but I could. Are you a man or a woman or what are you? You, you a horse? No one. You know what he's talking about? There is no one that can remove you from the hands of Christ or the hands of God. Don't listen to all that foolishness. No one means no one. And listen, I'll tell you another key word in John 10, 28 through 30 is the word snatch. You know what snatch is? You go to a mall and you're 80 years old and you go to a mall and you got everything you've got for a week and some kid comes along and snatches your purse, drags you through the mall, beats you up and takes your purse with your last $10 in it. That's called snatch. All right, on an evil way of thinking, that's a snatch. In other words, it's a, it's a seizing of something. Now, on the other side of snatch is a person who is drowning, and you're able to reach in and grab him, snatch him up off out of the dire strait he's in. Or, as the other day on the news media, where this man tried to snatch his purse, and that lady got, then that another man came along and put a whooping on him. Thank God for these people. I mean, one snatched the purse and the, and the other guy snatched him. And there's the word snatched. So, but look, all three, all three members of the Godhead are involved in sanctification. All three members. All three members are involved in uh, being in the hands of Christ, in the hands of God. So what does this, what does this, what does this teach you about the Godhead and sanctification? Let's go to First Peter. Let's go to First Peter, one two. And what's the Godhead, or the Trinity, as people say, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father? By the sanctifying work of the Spirit, that you may obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. Is that not powerful? You got all three members of God in it. They all have a specific, now they're one in person and three in action. They all have a different role in this process. That's phenomenal, people. Now, positional truth, point one. Positional truth is based on faith in the grace gospel, the grace salvation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as I wrote on the board. 
I want you to go back to Hebrews with me. We're at Peter's. Just, just drop back and watch, watch this little phrase for all time, the English phrase. I, I want to start in 727. Now, uh, we saw it up earlier in our, in our primary text, 1014, agreed for in Hebrews 1014. Here I am in the seventh chapter, and I'm in verse um, seven, chapter what, 27. Here we go. Who do, and he's talking about the priest who does not need daily like those high priests of the old covenant to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of his people. Because this he, Jesus Christ, did once for all when he offered up himself. See, that's that, is that same word offered. Now, now look. Stop and think for a little moment. Don't give me no quick answer on this. Who nailed him to the cross? According to that scripture, who nailed him to the cross? He did. He offered himself. Now, not literally, right? But figuratively, spiritually he did. He offered up himself. He offered up. What is the offering? It's Christ on the cross. The offering, it's got to be extended to the to the death, uh, uh, to burial and resurrection to have a completed picture, right? Because three guys are going to die, but only one guy offered himself. Uh, in the ninth chapter, verse 12, one of my favorite verses, and not through the blood of goats and calves, old covenant, shadow Christology, but through his own blood, historical Christology, he entered the holy place, that's heaven, once for all. In other words, he's not coming back to die on a cross again. Right? Not coming back to die on a cross again. Look at verse 28. Same chapter, verse 28. So Christ, also having been offered once to bear the sins of many shall appear a second time for salvation. And he's not talking about from sin. Without reference to what? Sin. He's coming back for salvation or deliverance, rescue. To those who eagerly await him. First time, that second time. First time he came to offer himself for sin. Once for all. Now, in verse 26... I mean, the ninth chapter, verse 26. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often. Talked about the high priest of Old Covenant. Otherwise, he would have, if he would have been like an Old co Covenant priest, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Okay? Now, once... Now, once at the consummation, right? We, we know what that is. We're at the apex of human history. We're now going to, we are now headed towards the second coming. Right? Look, the church of Jesus Christ, they call it the eminence of the return of Christ. You know what? We live in anticipation of it coming at any time. Well, we don't really live that way, but we should. Right? I mean, if we did, then we wouldn't worry about such little trivial things that we worry about that are, seem to be big. I suppose. I don't know. 1010. By this will, which is identified in verse 9, behold, I have come to do thy will to take away the first covenant in order to establish the second. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 12. See, we just, we, we got verse 10. You can remember the 10th chapter is really dynamite on this. Verse 10, verse 12, and verse 14. Here I am at 12. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand, right? You see? All of that establishes this positional truth deal. 
And why did, why did he go here? So that he could bring you into completed salvation and sanctification. For, for Not only for the salvation part, set you aside under the holiness of God. Listen, and every believer, every believer, every person that believes the gospel of Jesus Christ gets that deal. Nobody had that deal like that. And if you have one, you have three. And two is done, not by your might or strength or will, but by the power of the Holy Spirit and the word of God, right? By faith. In Hebrews the 13, chapter verse 12, 13, 12, Hebrews. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. You know what we call that? We call that Calvary. We call it Golgotha. They called it the place of the skull. In John 19, 17. Here's the second thing. Mechanics to positional truth is the baptism of the Holy Spirit at the point of salvation. Now, the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit based on the word of God, not based on any kind of feeling. Doesn't matter how you feel. You get this because it's part of God, the grace package. It's part of the grace package. You get, you get eight works of the Holy Spirit. One of them they work in conjunction. You get regenerated, you know. The Holy Spirit baptizes you into positional sanctification. These are all part of the eight works. They're all working in conjunction. The Holy Spirit indwells you. You know, the, you're sealed until the day of redemption, right? The eight works of the Holy Spirit. But you see, they, they work in conjunction to responsibilities. You get, the, you get eight works of the Holy Spirit the moment you believe the gospel. And, and, and listen... The only way you know this, you have to study the Bible. It's not going to come because you sit in church. You got to sit in the Bible to learn this stuff. And, you know, it, part of the, you can pick up this little package of 50 things and actually take it home and study it. And you'll learn all this. Now, here's another point. Look at here in this thing. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and Galatians 3, 27 are really important at this point in positional sanctification. So let's go take a look at this. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, a dynamite passage in a passage dealing with spiritual gifts, which one of the eight works of the Holy Spirit is every believer gets a spiritual gifted ministry. Man, I couldn't imagine once I was told that, I was dead on learning those things. I mean, I can't imagine you not being curious what gifted ministry you have for the church. I don't know. It just, I mean, if I think I got something come to me, I'm after it. You know what I mean? Tell me what that made me know. I, I, I'm a curious person, I suppose. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, but you ought to be too because the Holy Spirit wants you to know this. For by one Spirit, Holy Spirit, we were all baptized into one body that's at the point of salvation with the Jew or Gentile, Greek, Slave or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. One, one in the same spirit. There's no different Holy Spirit in any of us. It's the same guy in all of us. The pastor doesn't get a different kind of a Holy Spirit than you. Only thing different is my gift. Where do, where, now watch this now. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, where does it say, what, what, where, where does it take me? At this point of salvation, I'm baptized by the Holy Spirit into what? What is that one body? The church. That's, listen, 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter through the 27th, talks about 
the church, the one body of Christ called the church. Every believer is baptized. And people, I, I get this all the time. How do I become a member of your church? Well, you attend and give a lot of money. <laughs> now, that'll work. At least that's honest. That's what all of them believe. That's being honest. But that's not, of course, that's not what I tell them. They would like a better, that's the answer they would like me to say because that would be honest to them. And the one I give them is not going to be honest. But listen, the moment you got saved, you were baptized by the Holy Spirit into the church, into the body of Christ, the universal church. Your name in the Lamb's book of life is sealed forever. It is sealed forever at the moment of salvation. Think about that. That's positional sanctification. You do know that, don't you? Now, how you live. That's whether if you want rewards and stuff, if you want to lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, that's a whole different ballgame. This is a treasure that's been laid up from heaven to you on earth. Positional sanctification. Here's one. Let's go over a couple, a couple books. Let's go past 2 Corinthians to Galatians. Third chapter. We talk about this a great deal. Chapter 327. Now watch the difference here. For all of you who were baptized into Christ. See, that's a whole different ball game. Where's the body of Christ? On earth with part of it in heaven. Part of the, part of the church is in heaven. The other part's on earth. Agreed? Well, 1 Thessalonians 4 tells us that when the rapture comes. Listen to this. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Where is he? Right. right hand of God in heaven, isn't he? Right? If you're in Christ, when you die, you go to heaven because of positional truth. How about that? I didn't see any conditions on to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. Well, you gave your money, you did this, you did that. You... I didn't see none of that. I hear that. I don't see any of that. I hear that goofiness. You're all baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. Okay? It's a different day. See, over here, Galatians, I have to take Galatians off from there and I have to put it over here. I have to put Galatians 3.27 on this side, even though it's positional truth. There's a difference between being in Christ and being in the church. Because of the uniqueness of the church in the church, church age, right? You do understand that when you die, you go to, go to be with Christ because you're saved. Uh, Romans 15, 16, Paul says to be a minister, talking about himself, I've been called to be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God so that my offering of the Gentiles, listen to that, my offering of the Gentiles, that's the people he led to Christ, that my offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Sanctified by what? The Holy Spirit. That's positional, sanctified by the Holy Spirit, okay? In 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, I wrote on your paper, but we should always give thanks to God for you. Who, 
was a, one of the verses that we used to talk a great, great deal about with Graham's organization. But he was very animate about not just praying for the people to be saved, but the people who were saved. Now, the numbers got so crazy that there's no way you could carry a list around. Couldn't carry them on the front side. You couldn't carry them. So you prayed about people. Your presence in the community would have an impact on those who needed to be saved. That's the first part. But you were not through there if you worked for him. There was the second half of that, which took as much energy and much time and as much prayer and as much work as it did the front side. And that was to be sure that all of these converts had material to hold them and that they were connected with churches that would actually take care of them. Would hunt them down, bring them in, take care of them. And I hear, th and this was one of our texts, and I every time I read this text, I remember that. But we should always give thanks to God for you. That's the converts. That, that's the Thessalonians, the converts off these missionary trips. That we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. See, everybody really gets happy when somebody's saved, and we should. We should be happy when the prodigal son comes home. But we should be just as happy as he is now returned home, lives that victorious life in Christ that he missed the first time around. Huh? And we should be just as proud and just as happy as, as, and as celebratory as we were when he came home. That's what Paul is saying, in my opinion. Ephesians 1, 4 says, For just as he chose us in him, that's positional truth, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy, there's our word, blameless before him. See, though holy and blameless go together. Holy is a positional truth, and blameless is experiential. Do you understand that? Well, you do now. In uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, he says, such were some of you. Now, to know what some, some of you were, you have to read verse 9 and 10. He lists, he lists 10 cultural sins that became lifestyles of people. And he says to the church of Corinth, this is who you used to be. I know this is who you were because I came to this city and we went for you. We were after you. We came to this city to reach you with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We did not pass you up. I mean, we were, we were coached that, with Graham, we were coached that everybody, when you go into that city, everybody that you come in contact with is why we're there. Lead them to Christ. You give them the message. Do you do not wait till Graham comes to town? Listen, I, I never was part of anything that we didn't have more converse before Graham ever came than we got when he came. We always had more. Every meeting we had, every place we went to talk, every place we went to advertise, when we went out a radio station, when we went out a newspaper, we gave a clear gospel and gave an invitation. And we always, I never was part of one that we didn't have more people converted before than after. I mean, we are ambassadors for Christ. We don't sit around and wait somebody to do it for us. We boldly walk in there, right, William? We boldly walk in there and we tell them the truth because God has given us the privilege to do it. If they want to believe it, fine. If they don't, well, that's fine. Here's my telephone number like William does. Here's my telephone number. You're, I'll tell you, you're more available than I am. Here's my telephone number. That's what I tell about my catfish and the Lord's arm. 
Yeah, I love it. If you don't want to sit down and look at it. That's all right. Well, I, I can take it another way. Yes. <laughs> well, there you go, buddy. Such were some of you, a cultural sense of lifestyle. And then he says, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of God. Washed. What do you think he's talking about? Well, we'll wash away my sins. What he's talking about. What sanctifies me? The gospel of Jesus Christ puts me in a position. I mean, that. how good is this stuff? Oh. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, By his doing, not our doing, but by his doing, grace, you are in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. Betty, how long have you been? How, how, how many years have you been in Christ? Roughly. Yeah, how about that? Think about that. And think what, and listen to what he said you find in the Lord. And, and, and here's the way you gauge yourself. He says, you, what you got from him was wisdom from God. And how important is that? Some of, your, some of the most major issues in your life, Patty, has put you hunting in the word of God for the wisdom of God. I mean, the first thing you went, what does God say about it? The wisdom of God is just a key thing in your life. Your kids go off to college. Your dad gets sick. He's going to die. All these kind of issues that come in our life. We want to be... And listen, the wonderful thing is we know we have access. We know we can tap into the wisdom of God, that he will give me the wisdom to be able to handle this and deal with it. Do you realize how enormous that is? I mean, we kind of take that for granted, don't we? And, and it's okay because it's something that has been granted to us. The wisdom of God, I mean, I think of my own life, the wisdom of God, the righteousness of God, and sanctification and redemption I mean, these are all key things. I mean, who sets around and worries if I'm redeemed or not? I mean, the word of God is established that we just move forward in it. We don't give that a second thought anymore. Sanctification, we think more about, you know, setting our life, trying to set an example and be the things we ought to be that God is God desires from our heart. I mean, progressive sanctification is a big part, but we don't even think about positional sanctification. We don't even think about, oh, I may not, I better, better worry because I may not go to heaven. We know that's a done deal. I mean, God has given us that kind of wisdom and how comforting that is and how comforting it is to know that when you sit with somebody that you really do believe in your heart, you've walked the walk with them, you've, you've cried with them, you've prayed with them, you've brought people into the kingdom together. When they go through this experience in your life and you're able to sit and hold their hand and, and bid them farewell to a better place that I'll meet you at. I mean, how good is that? Oh, yes. I mean, it, I mean, I mean, for me, when I read a passage that the, the Jesus Christ who has become to me, who has come to us as the wisdom of God and the righteousness of God and sanctification of God and redemption of God. I mean, when I read that, I go like, oh, thank you, Jesus, because I understand every bit of that. I have all that. I've embraced all that. And I am so thankful for it. Here's my third. Positional. Positional sanctification protects the church age believer. And watch this now. In the angelic conflict, as well as from divine judgment. Like the great white throne judgment, the raft judgment. And that's because we live in Hebrews 926. We live in the consummation of the ages because we live in Christ. Positionally, that's a done deal. Because we live in the age of consummation. I like Romans 1, 1, uh, 8, 1. That's one of my favorites. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to what? For those where? In Christ Jesus. That's positional truth. See, every time you see in, in him, in Christ Jesus, that's positional truth. That's a positional. And listen, how did I get in Christ? I believe the gospel. The Holy Spirit baptized me. They're all grace principles. And I can be assured, I can speak with absolute assurance based on the word of God that my life is under what? No condemnation. My life is under no condemnation. I don't, and I don't let nobody tell me that. 
I let nobody get in my face and lie to me. I pop that on him right away. That's a great verse for you. Let nobody tell you any different. And in Romans, the fifth chapter, 16 through 21, he tells you the same thing about judgment. The judgment came through Adam, came from through the first Adam, but the last Adam takes it all away. First Adam gives it to you, and the last Adam takes it away. How good is that? And listen, when you read John, third chapter, you ought to read verses 18 and 19 and 36 about the word judgment. But you got it if you don't believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen to John 5, 24, one of my favorite. Truly, truly, I say to you, because I like the truly, truly ones. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me, believes in God who sent me, has eternal life and does not come into judgment and does not come into judgment. And you know why he will never come into judgment? Because he is passed out of spiritual death into spiritual life. That's why. Don't you love that verse? Yeah, I love that. Here's Job 1.10. The, the, listen, you're protected in the angelic conflict. Not only uh, are you protected from the divine judgment of wrath in Christ, right? But you're protected in Job, in Job 1.10. Uh, the devil says, oh, you've put a hedge around him. A spiritual electric wire keeps, keeps the demons away. You know how often we needed that? Fool mistakes. <laughs> How often do you say, oh, thank you, God, that I had the electric wire around me? The hedge. He said, oh, I, 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 I checked him out, but I couldn't get in. You had the electric wire up. The old farm boys, we, we knew about electric wires, don't we? Huh? And now, let me tell you where, where we always raised our watermelons, on the backside of our electric fence. And we run that thing when they were in, right? We ran that thing all the time. You get my watermelons, you'll have a shock. <laughs> damp, when your feet are all damp, do you hit that electric wire? You, oh, boy. You can, hear, you can hear them out in the pasture. Uh, he, Job 1.10, the hedge around you. And verse 12, the sovereignty of God around you. He said, God says to the devil, don't put your hands on him. I'm going to let you test them, but don't put your hands on them. Well, that'd have been a deal. Huh? And you know what? You may not believe the word of God, but the devil does. When God said, don't put your hands on him, he didn't put his hands on him. <laughs> I'm not sure you understand what he understands, but he didn't put his hands on him. Then when he came back a second time, in the second chapter, verse 3, he said, God brags, on jo brags to the devil on Job. He loves to do that. He said, listen, he said, there's no man on earth like Job. Now, that wasn't one of Job's, that wasn't Job's wife. That wasn't Job's mama. That wasn't one of Job's favorite kids that had the special coat. No, I know who had it, but I'm just saying. That was God. Now, if there's one guy in this whole world that knows if he's the only guy on earth, he, he's the guy on earth. He said, there is no one like him. You know what that, have you ever gone out in a playground and they choose up sides? You don't mind the first one they chose because it was either best friend or best player. Right? I mean, everybody knows that right off the bat. Everybody goes, ah, he chose him because he's the best player. I just got, if I'd had first choice, that's who I'd have got. Or they go like, well, I know why he picked him because that's his buddy. But boy, when God picked, when God says of all the people on the earth, I, that's my first choice. I, might, that's my, I pick Job, your choice. That's pretty big. That's pretty big stuff, isn't it? I pick Job. No man on earth like Job. And then in verse 26, in verse 6 of the second chapter, we see the sovereignty of God. Again, when it speaks to Satan, only spare his life. You can put his hands on him, but you can't take his life. 
And, and boy, did he put his hands on him. But he didn't take his life. And can I tell you that? Listen to me. Listen to me now. I love you, and I, I want you to understand that. The devil can't do it to you anymore than he could have done it to Job. You understand that? And, and, and when he puts his hands on you, he puts you through some pretty se se severe testing that God permits him to do. It's, it's because you've gained, it's, listen, it's because you've gained favor in God's eyes. You say, well, I think I'd like to skip it. Mm-mm, mm-mm. No, you never want to skip that. You never want to pass that thing off to something else or beg out of it because it has eternal rewards. You know, when God's, you know, when God, you know, who was God bragging to in heaven? He's bragging in heaven about Job on earth. Bragging in heaven. You think God's going to change his mind when everybody gets to heaven and they go like, anybody, it might be a gate question. Anybody know who God's, one of, one of his favors was in the time period of Abraham? Oh, I know him, probably Abraham. Nah, Job. See, we'd all picked Abraham, wouldn't we? We'd have picked wrong. Okay, but just, just remember that. Either God has his hedge up around you and he can't mess with you, or he lets him inside and he gives him strict orders about what he can do and what he can't do. And he never is permitted to go beyond what you're capable of dealing with. God never lets him. That's 1 Corinthians 10, 13. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I would, I'd write it because that could be knocking on your door. And my final point, positional sanctification guarantees eternal salvation to every believer in time and eternity. And next time you read John 10, 28 through 30, pay attention, no one can snatch. I also like Romans 8, 38 and 39. I am convinced well, if I could, if I could get you to do that, wouldn't this be a happy day? I am convinced. Now listen to the list. Most people stop right after the first one up here. I am convinced that neither death nor life, that'd be a stopper right there for most, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present or things to come. Are you kidding me? Most of us are done right now. Most of us all hung up either on things past or things coming. Nor powers, nor heights, nor death. That's where all your phobias are. Nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know what in Christ Jesus means? Positional sanctification. <laughs> That love of God is always there for you. It is never shy on you. The love of God is always there for you, even when you're a prodigal child, even when you're a reversionist. God still loves you in Christ. You have all the love of God. Now think about that. And when he disciplines you, he does it out of what? He can help do it no other way. How wonderful. What a wonderful God. What a wonderful God. Okay, well, that's as far as I can get tonight. Let's close in a word of prayer, and then we'll have our personal prayer time as a congregation. And maybe those who are still with us by the Internet, you might do that on yours. Maybe you could pause and have prayer with your family or who's with you tonight as you're watching the internet, because that's what we're about to do. Uh, and so we'd encourage you to do it too, uh, in your own circle. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight for these who have come our way and took some time out of their life, a busy day, to study the Word of God, to fellowship with one another. We thank you for the facilities, and we thank you for the people who have come and all of the freedoms that we have in the protection realm and the hedge around us tonight for safety. The, our security system has always been spiritual. We thank you for that. 
pray tonight, Father, the Holy Spirit would take the truth of the Word of God that we have delivered. People sort it out within their souls through the Word of God. Let the Word of God speak to their hearts and give them the truth. The truth has set them free, for we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.